Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan. I'm the Vice President at the Jefferson and I'm a Contributing Editor at the Erie Reader. I'd like to welcome you to a special program, a joint venture between the Public Policy Fund at Penn State Barron, the Institute of the American Dream at Penn State Barron, the Brock Institute for Mega Issues Education, and the Jefferson Educational Society. Here, we'll turn to our moderator for this conversation and invite uh, the panelists to have a pre-election discussion to explore the hidden issues in 2020's presidential election. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us for this conversation, as well as this discussion's moderator, Reverend Charles Brock, for bringing them all together and for facilitating this dialogue. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing this conversation's moderator, Reverend Charles Brock, who will then introduce our panelists. An Erie native, Reverend Brock is the Emeritus Fellow, Chaplain, and Director of Ministerial Education at Mansfield College, Oxford, uh, United Kingdom, where he taught for 35 years. Currently, he is the Minister of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Girard, Pennsylvania. He serves as the Director of the Institute on the American Dream at Penn State Barron, which will define, analyze, and compare concepts of individual, ethnic, and national American dreams, seeking their origins and evaluating who wins and who loses under the various definitions. He is also the founder and director of the Brock Institute for Mega Issues Education, which draws on the integrated wisdom of both Jefferson and Milton, aiming to develop methods for universities and think tanks to encourage students to learn on a broad scale in order to understand and respond to the many issues affecting America today. Reverend Brock is a founding member of the Jefferson Educational Society, where he directs the Brock Institute and serves on the Board of Trustees of the Jefferson as its secretary. Uh, before I turn it over uh, to this man for all seasons, Reverend Charles Brock, I do want to remind watchers and listeners for more information about both past and upcoming Jefferson Educational Society programs and publications, uh, turn tune to jeserie.org and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Reverend Brock, over to you, sir. Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate the uh, introduction, let alone the time that we can have uh, together for about an hour with uh, these really interesting panelists. And I want to have them introduce themselves. Paul Gamble from Gannon. Yeah, Paul Gamble. Uh, Charles said I went to Gannon, got my undergraduate degree there, graduate degree from Mercer's, currently employed as a community resource specialist, the federal probation office here in Erie, active in my union, still active after uh, even one retirement. With SEIU 668, I'm chairman of their statewide Civil and Human Rights Committee. I've been doing that for 10 years, been on that committee, Civil and Human Rights, for over 20 years. Terrific. And uh, Lena. Yes, hello. Thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Lena Surshko-Harned. I'm assistant teaching professor of political science at uh, uh, Berendt. Um, my research interests are in comparative politics and international relations, uh, most specifically in um, former USSR and Europe. So I'm very happy to lend any kind of expertise that I have on democracy in this particular panel. That's great. And uh, Rob. I'm Robert Spiel. I'm an associate professor of political science at Penn State Barron. I grew up in the state of Rhode Island and I went to undergraduate uh, University at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia and graduate school at Cornell University and got hired here in Erie right out of Cornell. So I've been here for a while. It's really great to have you here. Kathy Dahlkemper may be joining us. Uh, she planned to. Something may have gone wrong with her computer. Anyway, we hope to see her sometime in the show if that comes on. The purpose of the discussion is to look at some of the issues that have not been covered uh, in the election uh, rhetoric. I remember years and years ago when I first went to Harvard, the first forum I went to in 1960 was the question, what is not being covered in the election? And I thought, my gosh, you know, aren't they covering everything? But in fact, they weren't covering poverty or race. <laughs> Two of the, the hugest, biggest questions we have to face. And yet none of the candidates, including JFK, uh, addressed those issues. So I thought we would address uh, seven or eight issues like that tonight, things that are not covered. And just to introduce that, Roger Cohen, who writes for the New York Times, had an article yesterday, which I wanna quote just one paragraph from, called The Shrinking of the American Mind. Hmm. What wasn't said at the debates uh, and how telling that is. 
here are the words and or phrases that were never spoken some some of the words and phrases that were never spoken in the two presidential debates human rights inequality dictatorship israel palestine middle east united nations guantanamo european union nothing about europe whatsoever nothing about africa whatsoever nothing about south america nor anything about terrorism authoritarianism or alliances how do you not talk about those things but they didn't you know what it, it strikes me is that most people like the debates like the reason people often go to nascar they want to see the wrecks mm -hmm. they want to see people smashing each other in the face calling each other names that's what excites most americans unfortunately but tonight we're not going to call anybody names but we're going to try to analyze some of these issues not on a partisan basis i don't even know the parties that people belong to but rather on an academic basis that relates to our society and the lives we live so the first question i'd like to ask is what are the real issues then and now for the united states and rob it, it strikes me so often that people will say oh it's economics but in fact underneath that could be all kinds of uh, dark matters like race and like uh, the uh, uh, gays and immigration and Christian uh, power, uh, white supremacy, that sort of stuff. Anyway, I wondered what you thought, what, what, the, what the real issues are in the race that we have for 2020. Uh, it's a great question, Charles. If we look at American history, race and religious issues and some of the issues you just mentioned have been the main issues that have divided the parties. Uh, and that goes way back to the Whigs and the, and the Democrats back in the early 19th century and the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Uh, there have been some political scientists who have focused on how class and economics divide Americans. And probably between the 1930s and 1960s, the New Deal era in politics, uh, that was probably true. Uh, but before that and after that, some of those cultural and religious issues you mentioned are more likely to have divided Americans on party lines. And race is a big one. It's often understated. Uh, you often have uh, politicians feeling uncomfortable talking about race, or, or in the case of Donald Trump, maybe uh, some would argue too comfortable talking about race or what he thinks about racial issues openly. Uh, so, I mean, I, I guess I would say those are, those are the major issues. Uh, I, I mean, I think what happens now, what, what, the way the Republicans and Democrats are divided on current issues has much less to do with economics than on cultural factors. I mean, you, you hear sometimes people talk about the two tribes of politics, Democrats and Republicans. And I often get the sense, especially when I talk to students and others today, uh, that basically a, a lot of Democrats, particularly well-educated Democrats, might look down on people who vote Republican and for whom guns and religion and issues like that are the most important issues. And so the people who own guns and are very religious get resentful of that, and they begin to look down on the educated uh, intellectuals. And you know, it almost turns into an anti-scientific bias. They hate science and they don't believe what they see in the media that's written and talked about by the educated people, and it reinforces each other. Uh, both groups think the other, both groups look down on the other, both groups think the other side is foolish, uh, and it, it's divided the parties probably more than ever, and I'll, I'll stop with that and see, you know, if you want to follow up or ask a different question. Yeah, that's terrific, Rob. Well, what, what about that, Paul and Lena? Do you want to add anything to that? Okay. Uh, what I think we can get we can get back to some of those issues as well, but that's a that's a really a great answer, Paul. Uh, we're we're stuck with a lot of militias around the country, and it's it's a it's a topic that simply hasn't been brought up that, that I know of in in the election so far, and yet uh, and yet uh, the the Michigan militia wanted to capture the governor and kill her. Uh, this is amazing to me. And, and I understand from people like uh, Kathy Dahlkemper, my good friend, that there are plenty of militias in Pennsylvania. What do you think about all that? Oh, you better believe there's plenty of militias. 
Uh, first, let me say this here. I ran across this quote uh, yesterday when I was looking up some material for tonight. The problem in the world today is we forget we belong to each other. And that's a quote from Mother Teresa. Uh, malicious and, and some background of that didn't just come up during this election period. They actually uh, blossomed and grew during the uh, election of Barack Obama and have not only festered and uh, grew during his eight years in office, but once uh, the current president got in there, they became more active and more vocal. Militia in the United States, there are national groups, state groups, and local groups. We have militias as close as Bradford and uh, Westmoreland County. And they're uh, easily found on any website that you want to uh, check out and, and look up. But when you think in terms of what happened in Portland, when armed groups take over a state house, and in Michigan, a plot to assassinate, kidnap a duly elected governor in the state of Michigan, why? Not only why, but what has uh, it, it, it has our political divide brought us to that point where organized uh, militias can now dictate uh, violence because they may disagree with another group of people? And that's what we've come to. But how did we get to that point? In my view, and I think a lot, I've heard many people say it uh, this past year, we have a president sitting in the White House who has empowered these people. They've empowered these people on the right. Sadly, there have been no sanctions. We haven't seen anyone on the right, I shouldn't say anyone, we haven't seen those in the powers to be come out and sanction any of these groups or offer up uh, any voice of opposition. And what scares me is, what are we teaching our children about democracy? What are we teaching our children about uh, the republic we live in? Uh, we've already uh, damaged our, our reputation overseas is already damaged. Uh, no one can trust us. Uh, the, there's a, a lot of uh, undercurrent uh, current of uh, what's happened to the United States and we can't be trusted. We've lost our position of moral leadership and I'm afraid uh, of what the future might bring. These militias aren't going anywhere. Some are latent and some are very, very active. In this election cycle or in this election coming up next week, my fear is, and the FBI and Homeland Security and our law enforcement ag agencies across the country are on alert and very aware of the potential of violence. Can it happen in the United States? Can it happen at this time? We'll see. And we'll see. It's a potentially scary prospect indeed. Anybody else want to make any comments on that before we move on? Lena, uh, you come from Eastern Europe and are well aware of the problem of authoritarianism. Uh, and you've seen it in many different countries at many different places. Are we seeing that in America? Are we moving toward an authoritarian society? Which seems to me, if we are, that's another scary point. So thank you for that question. That is definitely a question that has been not just on your mind, but also on mind of quite a few researchers, especially those of us who do study comparative politics in Eastern Europe, Latin America, Africa, you name it. Um, I would say that the troubling conversation about authoritarianism um, and sort of the tendencies of populism and populist rhetoric and personalism that we sort of have seen even since the 2016 election have received some of the scholastic attention. 
So I just actually realized that I have Timothy Snyder right behind me, right there, the book on tyranny, right, that he published in 2016 and where he precisely addresses those very questions. Famously, Madeleine Albright also uh, spoke about her experiences, right, and so on about um, uh, her take on the rhetoric in the presidency. But this question about if we move into authoritarianism, um, let me address it from diff two diff couple of different perspectives. So on the one hand, um, empirically speaking, if we take a look at um, the democratic performance world over, we in trouble world over. So even if the 1990s, we saw sort of with the collapse of USSR, you saw quite a huge movement toward uh, democratic governance, towards democratic transition and so on in Eastern Europe and in Latin America and elsewhere. So there was sort of this, uh, what um, researchers called the third wave of democratization. In the last 13 years, however, there has been a rollback of that democratic governance again, all over the place. And not only in the countries like, let's say that I'm most familiar with like Eastern Europe or even India or even Brazil, but also in established democracies. Um, so there seems to be something going on globally. And my fear is that COVID is not going to help those particular performances in terms of uh, freedom of media in terms of uh, performance of um, elections and so on. And we know that empirically speaking again, in the last 13 years, um, several of the authoritarian leaders have moved to sort of extend their term in office very successfully. So why am I saying this about this? Why am I talking about this broader scheme? So we can see that United States still is very much part of this global community. Right? So we are seeing certain trends world over, and the United States is very much part and parcel of that trend. Um, why the rise of populism? There's many reasons, but you are, you're, to your question, are there concerns about seeing the United States move into authoritarianism? I would say yes. Um, there are absolutely, from objective perspective of how we measure democratic governance, we can definitely pinpoint to areas where there has been a decline in sort of this freedom and democratic governance in the United States and moving towards authoritarianism. Be it um, electoral law, and I'm sure that on all electoral restrictions, uh, questions about campaign financing, questions about gerrymandering that might also be impairing elections, to the big questions of electoral college. Um, to the relationship between the branches of government, as we have seen with the controversial appointment of uh, one more judge to the Supreme Court by this presidency. So from perspective of, again, of how we measure democratic governance, there are some trends that are troubling um, about the consolidation of power and sort of building of this vertical of power in the United States as well as, again, like I said, world over as well. Well, that's really interesting. And uh, that's another scary point, it seems to me. Uh, anybody wanna make any comments on that before we move on? And don't hesitate to uh, bring yourself in on that one too. Uh, I suppose okay. one more thing, if I may add, Charles, that's something that just occurred to me that I didn't sure. specify also, is that, um, I suppose, as Rob was suggesting earlier, that right that you have to sort of see the perceptions of authoritarianism and the threat of, from authoritarianism. You can see it probably from the supporters of both political parties mm, uh, moving forward, right? And to what degree sort of it is manifest, right? Whereas for like Joe Biden says, this is election for the soul of America, right? Speaking to the restriction on immigration, the restrictions to electoral rights and so on is the crux of that authoritarian um, sort of uh, threat of authoritarianism. On the same note, right? You hear Donald Trump evoking Marxism and doing the throwbacks to old fashioned sort of uh, totalitarian Marxist regimes like the USSR, right? To, and, or Cuba for that matter, right? Or Venezuela, right? And to bring that particular electorate into his fold. So yeah. it's very interesting also how this conversation about whether we're sliding into authoritarianism as a rhetoric is also being utilized um, 
by both sides of the argument. You know, Senator Ben Sasse, it just, this is not in my notes, but it just comes to me so vividly. Senator Sasse said, you know, Trump is kissing the butt of Vladimir Putin. I mean, that, that's a strong thing to say. But how come Trump has been so interested in Erdogan and Putin and Kim Jong-un and uh, the guy from Brazil, uh, Balasrano, uh, and all these other dictators when he, when he cocks a snoot uh, at, um, at, at Europe, uh, the, the free world, uh, Britain, Germany, France, and so on. He pays no attention to them. He loves these other guys. What's, what's going on here? Well, I think to some degree, it's pretty straightforward. It's about strong leadership, right? And we remember that quote about uh, when his people speak, or when he speaks, these people listen, right? They set up, they shut up and listen. I mean, that is the kind of um, sort of attention that we have come to expect from this president. And from the get-go, he made it very, very clear that he is all in favor of sort of the strong boss man. Uh, when he speaks, people sit up and listen. Well, that's not necessarily the case with democracy, right? Because disagreement and healthy debate is part of democratic governance. But this is probably part of his attraction. It's absolutely part of the attraction, right? To be uh, on friendly terms. And this is why his rhetoric also has been, we're going to be friends with Russia. We're going to be making friends with, we can make a deal with North Korea. We can have a great relationship with even China, uh, right? In the earlier days, right? There was this conversation, maybe we can even go that way. Um, so there is this attraction to the strong leadership, to the strong leader element, I think, with, with these guys. But also, it is very important to mention that recently, Vladimir Putin, in his recent interview, when he was commenting on um, this very latest debate between um, uh, Biden and Trump, uh, Putin chimed in on the accusation that somehow uh, Biden's son was receiving paybacks from Moscow and through some kind of shady deals. And in the First of all, Putin sort of denies this and he says, I'm not aware of any of this situation. But there is also kind of a cooling from Putin's perspective. Now, in my mind, Putin's always been kind of cool and watchful and cautious toward Trump. Um, but I think this kind of um, lately, the nationalistic rhetoric and this kind of America first attitude um, also souring that kind of relationship too, right? Because it's obviously, uh, probably is obvious to Vladimir Putin now too that this is not his best option either in the United States yeah. to make deals. Right, well, that, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, it goes back to, to some extent to the founding of America as well. And the fight between uh, Hamilton and, and Jefferson on the nature of government and uh, Hamilton and Adams, uh, John Adams, wanted a very strong central government and a strong presidential figure. Jefferson wanted a much more diverse uh, parish situation. Uh, so it's government from the bottom up rather from the top down. I mean, that's been a fight in the United States right from 1789, uh, 1620, really. Uh, when you take a look at the Puritan and Pilgrim settlements, uh, that fight was there as well. Or we're, we're doing it again, it looks like to me. Charles, I want to comment on something Lena said. Okay. Uh, hit me about these authoritarianism uh, and these the leaders in particular that she mentioned. You know, it seems in, in all these regime, regimes and our current president is how the easily how they easily despise first the uh, those they want to leave out. You know, uh, this this uh, idea of a disposable community and no kinship. Uh, and when I look at what's going on in our country, this illusion of us versus them. And our current president has been pretty good at doing that. Look at Portland, Oregon, and the protests that started uh, with the Black Lives Movement. And then all of a sudden, the violence was blamed on Black Lives Movement, and nothing was said about the extremists and some of these militias we were talking in that came in and started all uh, uh, this trouble. 
Then when I look at overseas, Belarus, is that how you say it, over, over in Europe? And Russia's interference, or I should say, yes, their interference with the people who are trying to get rid of a president who just said, well, you know, throughout their constitution, and he has remained in office through graft and corruption. And my fear is, will that happen here in the United States? if Trump loses. And I know this is supposed to be a, a nonpartisan discussion, but you know, I fear we're, we're gonna have a national crisis because we have the worst president in our modern history who will be sick enough to, if it's close, if we have a close election, he may try that. A lot of people are predicting that. Um, you're not the only one by any means, it uh, really was in the news all day today as well. Um, well, we can, we can come back to this uh, because the next question has something to do with it as well. It's about foreign affairs. And it's interesting that the Republicans were the ones who said, you know, we haven't talked about foreign affairs in these debates. And they tried to get the second debate uh, organizers to bring up something about foreign affairs. And, and they never did. So it's, it's curious that the Democrats didn't want to do that either because Joe Biden was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee for the Senate for what, 12, 15 years. I mean, he was on that for a long time. And um, foreign affairs are extremely crucial to the United States and yet we're not even talking about it. There's one point I'd, I'd like to bring out from the past, which has been in, in effect in the United States up until the last couple presidents. And that was uh, that there's been a, a national narrative in America that links most presidents together in what I would call a, a providential foreign policy. It's derived from several examples. Let me give you a couple. George Washington. The citizens of America, he said, are to be considered as the actors on a most conspicuous theater, which seems to be peculiarly designated by providence for the display of human greatness and felicity. Uh, that's very flowery language, but what he's saying is that he figures that the United States is not only an example to the world, it's not only a city on a hill, it's also an activist uh, uh, nation to help bring uh, democracy, freedom, and so on to the rest. John Adams, I always considered the settlement of America with reverence and wonder as the opening of a grand scene and design and providence for the illumination of the ignorant, the emancipation of the slavish part of mankind over all the earth. So he is, uh, as president, he is understanding that the mission of America is not just to America, but to the world itself. Now this, this, can, this can go badly wrong, but just to quote Lincoln, uh, and then I'll finish. Lincoln said, the American institutions contain the germ of freedom, which he believed would grow and expand into the universal liberty of mankind. Now, my question is, have we lost that historic narrative or should we lose that historic narrative? In other words, we have interfered in a lot of countries in the past century since Teddy Roosevelt. And some of the things have been good, some of the things have been horrible. But uh, as an overall picture of the mission of America, what do you think uh, the political parties ought, ought to take a stand on? As most of our presidents up until Obama and Trump uh, have not actually done so, but certainly George W. Bush and the previous presidents and Reagan certainly did so. Um, any of you might want to come in on that. Bob, uh, Rob, would you like to comment on that? And then certainly Lena want to get her. Yeah, I, I want to uh, defer most of this discussion to my colleague, Dr. Churchko Harnett, who, who, who uh, teaches some courses related to foreign policy, and I, I do not, but I do teach about American politics. Uh, I, I can say, you know, what you're, what you're talking about, Charles, there is often referred to in political science as American exceptionalism, the idea yes. that the United States is this shining city on a hill and we're a beacon to the world. And there was... Uh, you know, there has been consensus at times among Americans and among foreign policy elites that the United States should serve as that example. 
And then as you already mentioned, at times it's gone horribly wrong and people have reacted against that. Uh, in, in my American politics classes, when I teach about it, I often teach students the contrasting lessons of World War I and World War II. And the lesson that Americans drew from World War I is the United States has no business inter intervening or meddling in Europe's problems and let them solve their own problems. And you know, why should Americans die because Europeans and uh, people in other parts of the world are fighting each other? And that led to the strong isolationism that exists in this country before World War II, as Americans just sat there and did nothing as, as Europe you know, burst into flames and, and, and Hitler began to you know, invade neighboring countries and begin you know, the, the mass Holocaust of Jews and other groups. Uh, so the lesson of World War II is the United States cannot just sit back and watch the rest of the world go up in flames. And eventually the United States is going to get involved itself as we did when Japan attacked us. Uh, so the United States, it's better for the United States to try to promote democracy and promote liberal and, and ideas of freedom around the world. And then, of course, that leads to Vietnam. And Americans, again, learn the opposite lesson, that we shouldn't do that. And, you know, we probably learned that in Iraq. A lot of Americans are fed up with Iraq. A lot of Americans are fed up with nation building in Afghanistan, where the United States has been, uh, had military troops there for 19 years now. Uh, so it, it's difficult. And, and my from what I, you know, from following American politics, to be honest, I think the reason it didn't come up with the debates is that most Americans, and this is kind of sad, just don't care about the rest of the world. Uh, most Americans are not interested in what the problems of the rest of the world. Most Americans don't know where countries are. If you ask Americans to find Afghanistan on a map, most Americans are not going to be able to do so. Uh, and, and so, you know, basically the debate reflected that. Uh, but the problem is those people who do care about the rest of the world and those who you know, we're educated about the rest of the world, they do care. And it's kind of sad. And it's kind of sad the United States cannot serve as a lesson to the rest of the world anymore either. I think Paul was talking about, or, or Lena might have been talking about things like the Electoral College and stuff like that, which baffle people in other countries. You know, how can the United States call itself a democracy and have a system like the Electoral College and have a United States Senate where Wyoming with half a million people gets the same representation as California with 40 million people? So I'll stop there, and, and, uh, and Paul or Lena may want to jump in. Sure, that's really good. Lena, you have a perspective from outside here. It would be really interesting to hear it. Sure. Rob actually hit on several of the important key points that I was going to bring up as well. Um, so this historical mission, as you call it, the shining city of the hill, right, obviously has um, caused some reflection especially in the last 20 years, right? And this also has been sort of the rhetoric that was used from outside, notably by Russian Federation, right? That to argue that United States has been long overstepping its boundaries by assuming this civilizational democratizing mission world over. Um, so in many ways, um, the perception of United States from Russia and from other authoritarian regimes might be just that, that the United States needs to, needs to find its own boundaries. Um, and the absence of foreign policy, I think Rob is also absolutely correct, that foreign policy historically is the least of the problems for Amer at least salient issues for the American public, right? They, and especially at the times of COVID-19, especially at the time of pandemic, where domestic issues are so much more prevalent and so much more important. At the same time, the absence of foreign policy can also have been said by a foreign policy issue in the debate could also be the, basically the absence of coherent foreign policy to start with, um, right? In terms of what has really been the foreign policy for the last four years um, outside of America first. Um, and that sort of determines a lot of this debate as well. Obviously, European allies have taken a step back to really reevaluate their relationship with the United States. Um, the historical allies of the United States, the adversaries, everybody's sort of kind of on notice about this unknown that is coming. Um, so there's plenty of reasons why it's absent from debates. But whether or not the United States has lost its historical mission, I think it, it, it's, it's still, the jury's still out, uh, right? Because like, Rob is pointing out, and I agree with him absolutely, this narrative has been advanced and reevaluated and advanced and reevaluated on a number of occasions, a number of times with plenty of evidence to support the, the um, sort of 
saliency and the validity of both. Right. Okay, well, great answers uh, to you. Thanks so much for that. Uh, uh, Charles, I wanna add something too. You know, sure. it, uh, I think if we were to have a second Trump term with this America first policy, we, uh, it's gonna leave America behind. Uh, the rest of the world is tired of us. And, and Charles, you should, you probably remember this. The other folks don't. But I remember being a kid and Khrushchev came to the United Nations, mm -hmm. the big bully from Russia. Remember that? And he I got do. up there and he would, took With his, his shoe, shoe off and he was banging on <laughs> it. And, and, and America, and we said, oh my God. Well, that's how the rest of the world looks at Trump. You know, and they look at Trump's America. You yeah. know, with 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 uh, his policies and and his racist attitudes on race, you know, the detention of children in cages mm -hmm. and illegal detention of people whose only crime was freedom and escaping oppression. You know, they wanted the American his dream. Attitude, yeah, his attitude towards women, you know, and his disdain for people other than the wealthy. And so the rest of the world is looking at America and saying, you know, something, I don't know, I, I uh, you know, it, you know, and they're hedging their bets, you know, yeah, and, sure they are. and, you and they we've are. lost our leadership role in the world. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Well, uh, many thanks for the three of you on, on that one. And Ben, do join in if you feel up to it, that you want to do that sort of thing, that'd be fine. Uh, I wanted to ask Kathy this question, but alas, she's not here. Kathy Dahlkemper, our county executive, was uh, in Congress and was instrumental in getting the uh, Obamacare through, the Affordable Care Act. And now uh, the Republicans want to dismiss it totally. What are the real reasons, do you think, for the opposition uh, to the Affordable Care Act? I mean, why, why are people upset about that? Uh, 30 million people will lose their insurance if the uh, Supreme Court, for example, uh, decides it's unconstitutional, which they may well do. Uh, they have a six That's majority now. now. Yeah. But what, what are the real reasons for wanting to throw it out without having a plan in its place? Anybody want to comment on that? I, you want me to go ahead, Charles? Sure. For that or, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I believe it's just complete partisanship, Charles, which is a shame in our country. Uh, the gist of the Affordable Care Act, the individual mandate, uh, which originally had a tax penalty for people who don't purchase private health insurance, was actually a conservative Republican idea in the 1990s, started by the Heritage mm -hmm. Foundation and promoted by former Republican House Speaker Newt Gingrich. And the idea was to present a capitalist private insurance-based alternative to the, to the what, socialist medicine or socialized medicine, uh, you know, a, a a universal health care system or a single payer system that was being promoted by some Democrats. So it began as a conservative Republican alternative to the idea, a way to cover all Americans uh, without, you know, having a single payer system by using and expanding the private health insurance system. And then, of course, Mitt Romney, as governor of Massachusetts uh, in, in the first decade of this century, promoted the same idea. And it was called Romney Care in Massachusetts, and it was an individual mandate. And then all of a sudden, Barack Obama promotes it as president in 2009, <laughs> and Republicans decide this is a horrible idea. This is social, socialism, and we shouldn't do it. And it was completely partisan as a way to oppose Obama. Uh, most of the early opposition to the Affordable Care Act was among people who didn't understand what was in the bill. And most of the opposition today remains that way. It's, uh, people throw around the epithet socialism. We don't want that. Uh, the Affordable Care is the opposite of socialism. It's actually... It's forcing people to purchase private health insurance as a way to cover them. Uh, many people think that raised premiums had something to do with the Affordable Care Act, which is partially not true. I mean, the, the only impact, a majority of Americans get health insurance today through their employer. And the only impact the Affordable Care Act had on those private employer-based health insurance plans was to require they provide some minimum coverage. So. For instance, in the past, you used to have uh, in insurance plans that have a maximum coverage of $100,000 in a year, 
or maybe a million dollars in a lifetime, and they wouldn't cover a lot of services. They wouldn't cover various preventive services like vaccines. Okay. Uh, the Affordable Care Act does require stuff like that to be covered. Mm -hmm. It got rid of the maximum coverage limits. Uh, as we know, Kathy Dahlkemper, you know, is not unfortunately not with us, was one of the chief people responsible, the, the key person responsible for making sure young adults uh, ages 19 to 26 would be covered under their parents' employer health insurance plan. Uh, the, the big change of the Affordable Care Act was to create those exchanges, those state-based exchanges, to allow people who used to have, who did not get insurance through an employer and did not get health insurance through the government because they were not old enough or they did not have low incomes low enough, uh, or they weren't a veteran or a federal government employee, you know, people who had to shop for themselves for health insurance, they now have exchanges where they can compare various rates and they can compare various services. They didn't have that before. And the Affordable Care Act was basically a way to improve the capitalist market for health insurance. And that's why it was originally a Republican, conservative Republican idea in the 1990s promoted by Mitt Romney. And then when Mitt Romney ran him against Obama for president, he insisted that Romney care was completely different than Obamacare. It was totally different. And what Romney supported as governor of Massachusetts was completely different than what Obama completed as, uh, supported as president, which is just not true. Uh, basically, the central idea behind both was the same. So it's just, t from my perspective, Charles, it's complete partisanship. That's what it sounds, that's what it sure sounds like. Anybody else want to make a comment on that? Just okay. think Obamacare uh, taxes would just be, repeal of it would just be a big tax cut for the rich. I, 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 I think it has to do with money. And the wealthy just don't want to pay more or don't want to pay their fair share. Yeah, uh, I'm sure that has a lot to do with it. As well. One of the things that I can just add to this, because as Rob was talking about this partisanship and perceptions of socialism, right, it kind of strikes me very, um, it's very upsetting as an educator also, this sort of degree of misunderstanding of what words like socialism stand for, misunderstanding of um, the ideologies really and using these types of words as a scaremongering technique. Uh, right, so that is just my two cents on, on that particular discussion, right? To what degree that kind of partisan talk is actually sort of flipped and uses the terminology to the great detriment without uh, people actually knowing and understanding. Yeah. Well, that, that is so important. That leads me to another, another question altogether. <clears throat> um, and it's related to this. How do we better educate the public on fundamental issues for our elections. I mean, obviously, they know very little about what's going on. Now we got the Jefferson, we got the uh, Public uh, Policy Fund, we got the Institute of the American Dream, but they have very little impact on on the, the students, let alone the population. How how do we how do we get out to the population and even to tell them the difference between socialism, capitalism, and communism, which nobody seems to understand? How do we do that? I can provide an answer, but Paul, did you, did Paul want to go first or? No, you go ahead, Rob. Okay. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I mean, I mean, Charles, I mean, I, there are many answers to your question, but I'll begin with an answer that you, that Charles, you know, is an, a pet peeve of mine, an interesting issue of mine, which is the lack of emphasis on taking classes about politics and government and civics at the college level. Uh, it, it's not, it's not well taught at the high school level, but even at the college level is, Charles, you and I have talked before about how several states now, including their two largest states, California and Texas, and I think Florida may now too, our third largest state, they require all students who get a public university degree to take a college level class on politics or civics. And you cannot get a degree in those states without it. Pennsylvania, we almost do the opposite. We discourage people from taking classes on politics and government. Most, uh, you know, and I, I apologize to my employer, but most Penn State students graduate without taking, ever taking any class on politics or government. And we turn them out into the world and say, okay, you know, now you should know how to vote and you should know how to analyze issues and you should know how to think critically about what politicians say, even though you've never had a course on politics or government or civics. Yeah. And I would like to them, change that. Yeah, go ahead. We expect them to be leaders as well. You know, yeah. I mean, the college educated people are the ones who lead the country uh, for the most part. And yet most of them have had no training whatsoever in, in public policy issues. Exactly. And to take it even a step further, right? We've had this conversation 
um, several times also, this whole idea about perception that university education somehow is liberal education, right? But again, right back to misunderstanding the basic terminology of calling sort of liberal arts education being fearful, right? That somehow students are being indoctrinated into liberal doctrine, uh, which is also fantastically troubling in its own right. Uh, so we, Rob is absolutely correct. We are graduating folks um, with very little training in critical thinking and even factual knowledge about their own country, let alone the rest of the world. Um, so I think that to some extent helps to explain uh, the success of the Jefferson, don't you, Ben, that, that we actually get onto this uh, stuff all the time at the Jefferson, we get big crowds, you know, I think there is a hunger for it. And uh, somehow, we're at least on a small percentage of the population in Erie, we're able to supply that. I'd, I'd agree with that, Charles. I'd, I'd uh, borrow a line from our colleague at the Jefferson, uh, Andy Roth, who says, um, while we long for Jefferson's world, we live in Hamilton's world. I know we talked about the two earlier and the differences, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly our, our namesake, Jeffersonian education, civics education, if you could educate the masses, you can entrust them with their government. And so, you know, following that and trying to get uh, lifelong learners engaged in learning to tap into issues they may have missed out in high school, they may have missed out in college if they had that opportunity, that they have access to that and because a community think tank is putting out programming to better inform the population. I think it's critical work and I think there is that hunger for it. One of the things we hear often from outside speakers that come into Erie is they're marveled that uh, a place like Erie, Pennsylvania has a community think tank. It's not a common thing to find around the country. Uh, it's hopefully something that uh, we can continue building and, and see farther, uh, you know, have farther reach out into the country to really make sure people have access, equitable access to educational resources. And it's been great to be doing this digitally because now people don't have to physically show up into a room to learn. All of these uh, resources are available online for free where people can take advantage of that. Okay, that's, uh, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's uh, very helpful. Uh, I have five minutes to go. We got one last question. I wanted to ask Rob something about gerrymandering, but you can see his lectures on that. Uh, I think Jefferson streams it. I think we, you've done gerrymandering, which is such a huge problem. But I think we've streamed that already, Rob, so uh, people can look that up. And it's so important that they do. Here's the last question. Are we doomed to being, having partisan divides on every American issue? Uh, what are the, uh, which we might call binary thinking? Yes and no. You're either right or you're wrong. Uh, you're either with me or you're against me. Uh, what are the roots of that? I mean, wh what, what is going on here in this country that makes us so against each other? Well, let me answer that, uh, begin that. No, I, I think American and Americans are resilient and we'll get through this period. Um, I honestly believe in the American dream and that's coming from an African American who has lived through a lot. Uh, I've lived through prejudice. I've lived through uh, discrimination in my life and in my family's life. Uh, but I believe we'll get past this. You know, this divide, if, well, let me put it this way. If we don't, we won't survive. Mm. We, we just won't. And that's, that's it. Thanks, Paul. That's really nice to end on a hopeful note. Does anybody want to have a sadder note? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that can wrap us up, Ben. And um, it's really good to end on a positive note. And thanks for plug for the American dream on that too, Paul. Thank you so much, uh, the, all of you. It's really <laughs> been enlightening. We got to do this again four years from now. So I. I'll, I'll, we got to do it a, sooner than that, Joe. I'll, I'll still be a spring chicken, so uh, we we can we can look forward to that in four years from now. And thanks to the audience for looking in. Um, support the Jefferson. Support public policy funds, uh, and uh, we'll all see you on the other side of the American dream. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, gentlemen. Nice to see you.
Yeah, a big thanks to our entire panel and to you, Charles, for putting this all together. Uh, folks, we are so happy to have you watching along. We look forward to seeing you sooner than four years. We're coming back. We'll bring this panel. Uh, <laughs> thank you for tuning in for the Public Policy Fund, the Institute of the American Dream, both at Penn State Barron, the Brock Institute, and the Jefferson Educational Society for this pre-election discussion to explore the hidden issues of the 2020 election. Thank you all for learning and listening with us. Good night. Bravo. Thank, thanks so much. And, and good